Rubicelli Hernandez Monter, and Zesna Garcia Rios, former members of the Northwest Arkansas Community College Dreamers, an organization composed of students who were brought into this country without documents as children, discuss their life experiences during a September 2017 program at the Shiloh Museum entitled Untold Stories of the American Dream. First, we hear from Rubicilli. I was born in Puebla, Mexico. Um, when I was about 11 years old, after fifth grade, after finishing elementary school um, in Mexico, my family decided to migrate to the United States. I have family who have been here. Um, my grandpa have been coming to the U.S. since early 70s, going back and forth, um, working. And I have some sort of familiar roots already in the U.S. And my parents wanted, I was going to meet my uncles. <laughs> I was going to meet my grandpa that I have never really seen a whole lot. Um, so we moved uh, from Central Port, Mexico to Oklahoma. But after a couple months, and um, my family relocated here to Arkansas, to Springdale, Arkansas. And I have um, attended Helen Tyson Middle School, Central Junior High, Howard High School, NWAC, uh, Northwest Arkansas Community College. I have also attended the University of Arkansas where I completed a bachelor's and a master's degree. So I've been here pretty much. I, it was really surreal to realize that more than half, more than half of my life had been spent in the U.S. And it was really interesting to find how you develop a sense of home even though it might not be your hometown because you were not born. Um, I feel some, growing up now, looking back, I, I have stronger ties to Springdale, Arkansas, than the ties that I might have in Puebla. Because I have experienced so many things. I grew up here. I was 11 years old, so I spent my teenage years here in Arkansas um, having new friends, new, new developing my uh, my academic side, learning about what it is, learning about civic duty here in the U.S., what it means to be a U.S. citizen, because I did went to, as I mentioned, to school here. I pledge allegiance every day will come out in the intercom out and respectful of the U.S. flag. I see it as part of my hometown, as a part of my nation, because I've been growing up here in the U.S. But a really shocking time, it was teenage years again, whenever I realized that I couldn't obtain a driver's license. So everybody at around 15, 16 years old, they were getting their driver's license. They were being able to get a little bit more autonomy from their parents. They were able to go to the movies. And um, I had to obtain a ride uh, from someone else or from a friend. And that was part of it. Perhaps getting rides was not that bad. But a big shocker was when I was a senior in high school and I meet with my school counselor and I talk to them. They look at my, at my, um, list of classes on my GPA, my cumulative GPA. And they tell me that I can apply to all these scholarships. I can apply to whichever, high, whichever college or university because they will be happy to have a student like me. And then. Later on, investigating as they were helping out on completing college applications, I find out that I do not have a social security number. And that put a big hole. And the conversation was really intense. Whenever your school counselor tells you, you can go to school, but you might not be able to go because your family earns below the, the federal poverty level, uh, wage, and you have to pay out-of-state tuition. It might be too expensive for you. Um, so that time, I all I did was hold back and go to the library <laughs> and absorb the information. Because I was not asking to have it easy. I was just asking to have the same opportunity as anybody else, as my classmates. And um, I was able to, later on, I was able to get directed by people in the community 
organization in the community that were able, or organizational leaders that were able to connect me. Like one of them is the Hispanic Women's Organization, Margarita Solorzano, she's here, executive director, uh, which provided a small scholarship to any student who applied. And we're talking about $200 scholarship, $500 scholarship. On my senior year, on my last semester of my senior year, I ended up applying at about 20 to 25 scholarships. And um, I was able to earn a little bit, a lot of those small scholarships, and I was able to apply to Norris Arkansas Community College, and I, I was able to get enrolled, be involved, and pay for my own tuition, out-of-state out of tuition. And that's how I entered the college uh, at NWAC. And then around this time, that's whenever DACA came around uh, in 2012. I was already a college student. And DACA came around in 2012. And I remember that day, I was with a friend as well. And we learned that we could have a work permit. A work permit. I was allowed to work. Uh, and uh, and I was allowed to have the opportunity to legally drive in Arkansas by obtaining a driver's license. And I was able to pretty much work to pay my way out through school because even though we were able to work, we were not able to get the in-state tuition, although I graduated from the high school in Arkansas. And with that, it was... It, 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 DACA, the for Action for Childhood Arrivals, was a game changer uh, because it allowed me to work. I, weren't, I was not asking for any kind of social security service. DACA students do not qualify for any kind of welfare or any kind of social security benefits. And honestly, that's what we're not asking. We're just asking for the opportunity to be able to work for ourselves, to be able to work for our families, and be able to better our have opportunities to education. And through that, I was able to complete my associate's degree at NYC, and I was able to transfer at the University of Arkansas. Um, it was really surreal, <laughs> very surreal thinking that I was an official student at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Because it was, it's one of those flagship institutions that it does have a lot of um, history and a lot of home, homeness, like home essence to it. And um, I remember the first days I would type, write back emails to my former friends and mentors at NWAC saying, can you believe it? I'm at the U of A. I'm walking through the halls of the U of A. I'm walking through the names. Uh, my name is going to be there. And uh, I graduated in 2015, and I continue. Um, I had the aspiration to obtain a graduate degree. And again, with uh, guidance of professor at the U of A mentioned, you know that they offer it. I, I'm interested in higher education. Um, you know that the University of Arkansas offers a higher education degree, a master's degree, and I decided, I thought, you know, like, I'm not the smartest kid in town, um, you know, <laughs> so, um, but I gave it a shot. I applied, I took the GED, and I was able to complete a strong enough application to, to prove to the professor that I will be an asset to their program, and I did complete it in 2015. And through those years, I was working at the U of A as a graduate assistant, as well as NWAC. So once you're a dreamer, you're going to find hard worker people. Uh, you're going to find individuals who pay themselves through college and who had perhaps one or two or maybe even three jobs, um, little jobs on the side, trying to manage. Also, they're really dreamers are also really good at scheduling, making sure you have enough time to drive from one place to play B, place A to place B. And um, currently, I was involved through college, and I was able to be the co-founder for a scholarship at NWAC who provide financial support through a small, again, small scholarships made a big difference in my life uh, going through college. 
So this is the um, Life's uh, Legacy Scholarship in which we have, it was a bunch of maybe a couple more than one dreamers in that um, scholarship. And even though at that time, this is the fourth year that the scholarship has been in place. And that time, DACA has been really recently being put in place. We decided, you know what? We're still in college, but we have the opportunity to work. Let's put a hundred dollars out of our pocket and create a $800 scholarship. And that's a scholarship that's being renewed every year since then. And we're able to provide a little bit of support and enthusiasm to an individual who might feel like they are, there are no options for them or there's no support for them, but they do have big dreams. Currently, I'm working at a private foundation here in Norwest, Arkansas, and I am continue to even more learning uh, to love, um, knowing what the, uh, the foundation does here in Northwest Arkansas, and it's amazing the work that the foundation has been done. That's my story, and for now I will pass it if to Ms. Cessna Garcia. She has an even greater story than mine, perhaps. Uh, my name is Zesna Garcia Rios. So my my story is very similar, and I'm I'm actually just gonna sit down and like chill for a little bit because I just came from the university, um, where I am a TA to two different professors. So um, we're gonna take this a little bit slow, and we're gonna keep it conversational. But yes, my name is Zesna Garcia Rios. I um, I and my family moved here whenever I was three years old. So this is back in 1992, um, in the summer of 1992. So it would have been like mid Bill Clinton rise in uh, in Arkansas. Um, so I and my family moved to Bentonville, Bentonville, Arkansas, and uh, my parents worked predominantly in in chicken factories. I went through the um, the Bentonville public school system. Um, I was heavily involved in the arts, um, and I was. Um, I guess involved in theater and choir and all the all the normal kid stuff, and very similar to to Rubicelli's story, um, I didn't really understand the um, the issue of legality until I actually had to face it uh, head on. As I mentioned, like I said, I was in I was in theater and choir and did all that stuff. Um, my senior year, my high school choir was invited to go sing in New York in Carnegie Hall. Um, which was a huge honor, and I didn't know whether or not I was going to be able to go. Um, and that was my very first experience of, um, I guess, dealing with my status. Prior to that, obviously, like Ruby Sally said, your friends start getting jobs, your friends start driving, and they start having that, that freedom. I didn't really have that, and I didn't really experience that uh, because of, of my status and being undocumented. Um, and it wasn't until then, in that moment, that I had to decide to discuss my status with my choir director. That was the very first time I ever spoke to an adult um, outside of my family about my status and my legal uh, standing. So, long story short, uh, I spoke to my professor, my teacher, my choir director. I spoke to my choir director and I told him my story. And needless to say, he said, well, you're one of ours. We can't leave you behind, so we'll figure it out. Well, it turns out that if you're under the age of 18, you can travel without a, a regular ID. You can travel with a student ID from your high school. So I was able to travel no problem because I was still technically underage. So first big hurdle. Next big hurdle, similar to what Ruby Sally was saying, is applying for colleges, going to school. Same issues. Um, I didn't have a social security number, so I didn't know if I was going to be able to go to school or not. Um, at the time, I um, was interested in music education, and I was able to secure a um, music scholarship at Arkansas Tech. I only lasted at Arkansas Tech for about a year, because I was having to pay out-of-state tuition as well. And this is the part where I get a little bit emotional, and, and please bear with me. I was, I, I was having to still pay out-of-state tuition, 
and I didn't understand how it was affecting my family back in Bentonville financially. Financially, um, taking care of a family of six, because it was me, my two sisters, my brother, and my parents, and having to pay out-of-state tuition out of pocket um, was a huge financial burden for my family. And very similarly as well, my, my family um, was not making a lot of money, so it was, it was definitely a, a big financial struggle. So after my first year at Arkansas Tech, I moved back to Bentonville, and uh, I um, and my parents decided it would be best that I go to, to NWAC. Well, I, at the time, was not very active in, in the community. I was um, kind of bummed out, um, a little, little upset um, at all of the different hurdles that were simultaneously being thrown at me. And I just, I just kind of sat there for a while and, and didn't really want to do much. Um, and it wasn't until, again, Rubiseli and I have another thing in common. Um, my parents spoke to Margarita, and um, Margarita had made the wonderful suggestion that I get involved in the community. And I guess that was that. After, after um, I, I had met with Margarita, she invited me to several events um, where students would get involved um, in local government, state government, and we'd go down to Little Rock and learn how, how that works. And oh my goodness, my love for government just exploded. Um, I no longer wanted to study music. I wanted to study, I wanted to study journalism because I love freedom of speech. Um, and, uh, now I have, I'm doing a master's degree and I'm studying political science. So I love government. Um, and I love, uh, learning about our government. But if it wasn't for Margarita, I, I wouldn't have discovered that, that giant love that I, that I now feel and I love to share. So, um, a couple of things happened after after those initial meetings. I went to a um, a dreamer camp down in Conway, um, and I learned how to share my story without crying, which I still can't do. But I learned to share my story, and I learned to um, talk about the human aspect of immigration. So here's the thing with immigration, and the thing whenever you're talking about legal issues is that you get two two sides of of the coin you have the human aspect where you you think about laws and you think about how laws affect people and then you think the um the logical i guess i guess the the laws are laws are laws are laws kind of way of thinking and i understand both um i understand that we do have laws that are in place to protect us but i also know that there are laws that are in place to make sure that we are taken care of as people. And that's that's kind of where where I've I've gotten I've gotten into in my in my area of study. So all of that being said, I've gone and worked in um in the nonprofit world. I volunteered with many nonprofits in the area and outside of the state. Um one summer I went out to live in in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, where I worked with uh, Wilmington Undocumented Youth um, and to teach them about the DREAM Act and, and what, what that, that is and, and how it would affect them. And I've, again, I've volunteered for, for many other organizations that have gone up to, to D.C. So my involvement at the U of A, Dr. William Schwab wrote or was in the beginning of writing a book called Right to Dream. And um, he interviewed several of us to get some information on uh, the Dream Act and Dreamers in Arkansas and how Dreamers were living and what their life was like, what their stories were like. And he's a sociology professor. Well, um, Bill interviewed Juan Mendez and myself. Um, and Juan and I have been um, involved in, in Dreamer activity in the DREAM Act since 2009, 2010, around that time. Juan was actually uh, involved before I was, but he was the one that got me involved. But this book created um, an opportunity to share those stories. And um, later on that same year um, that 
that he was finishing up his book, we had a conversation at the University of Arkansas over at the Fayetteville Town Center with about 800 people talking for the first time about what it was like to be an undocumented student at the University of Arkansas. Um, and all of this was proctored with Dr. Dr. Gearhart. It was probably one of the most terrifying events, but it was also one of the most amazing events because it, it opened up the door to have a, another conversation about what it is that we need to do to better understand each other. Since then, I, um, I went from not knowing what to do and being in, in my parents' living room and crying and maybe knitting and doing everything else that I wasn't supposed to be doing to speaking in diversity, diversity panels um, about being undocumented in Northwest Arkansas. And the one, I guess the one thing that I want to um, leave with you guys and, and the takeaway that I want to, that I want to leave is that I, I grew up in, in Northwest Arkansas. I grew up saying, you know, the, <laughs> saying the Pledge of Allegiance, singing the national anthem. This is, this is a place that, uh, that I call home. This is a place that I love. And I would, I would do anything for, for my home state. Um, and I would do anything for, for the country that I now call home. It's a, it's a really tough conversation to still have. Being undocumented, having now DACA, um, and having the possibility of, of it being taken away. But at the end of the day, I just, I want to be able to, to give back. I want to be able to contribute to, um, to my region, to my state. And ultimately, that's, that's the reason why I'm, I'm going to school. That's why I contribute, continue to contribute to the nonprofits that I, that I volunteer for. Um, and that's why I continue to, to work in my community because it, this place has impacted my life so much so that I just can't, I can't see life without being in Northwest Arkansas.